Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the Hindu analysis for today. Let's begin with the first article that is focusing on the poverty data that has come out with a special reference to the state of Tamil Nadu. Now, this is not a very, very easy article to understand if you read it on your own. Let me try to give you a gist of what this article is all about. So this article says that the poverty ratio in Tamil Nadu as per the recent government numbers has declined considerably from 4.89% to 1.57%. This is the data with respect to multi-dimensional poverty index called the MPI. Now many people have questioned that how can there be such a huge drop because in terms of poverty such a huge drop is not really possible for most of the big states and Tamil Nadu is a big state. So these authors are saying that the reason why there is such a big drop is not because some numbers have been fudged but this big drop is actually because the multi-dimensional poverty index is very unique and there has to be some changes made in this index and how it actually calculates the data of poverty. They say that the Niti Aayog that actually publishes the multi-dimensional poverty index bases this index on the data given by the National Family Health Survey number 4. This particular index talks about 12 indicators. There is an average score given for all these indicators and as per the survey if a person's deprivation score is 0.33 or higher than 0.33 then the person is considered as multi-dimensionally poor. So earlier we used to estimate poverty just by understanding how much money does a person earn, how much money does a person spend and only in terms of money. But now the multi-poverty dimensional index actually takes into consideration many other things as well like the health, the education, the standard of living, so on and so forth. So it's not just about money and how much you're earning or spending. It is also about your overall life. And that is why the interesting part is that people may be deprived in certain functions, but overall they might not be multidimensionally poor. There may be a person who is very, very poor, but just because his or her health is fine or other indicators are better, the person will not be considered poor in the eyes of the multidimensional poverty index MPI. And that is why in Tamil Nadu and in many other states, we have seen such a big decline in the number of poor people as per the MPI. Again, the reason is that the person may be poor on one on two scales, but the overall average he is not poor in that. That is why this number might be slightly misleading. And rather than focusing on the overalls, we have to focus on individual dimensions that we have actually missed out. There have been a lot of questions on the data that has been collected by the government agencies, for example, the National Family Health Survey. The questions on these data as per the author is not very new. The questions on the government's collection of data has been raised since the 1950s. It is true that almost every government that is in power wants to show and wants to publish only that data that makes its own policies look good. So whenever they have a data that does not make them look good, they will never publish that data. They take an example of Tamil Nadu. They say that in terms of Tamil Nadu, there is no reason why poverty should have declined so much. If you look at the pandemic, during the pandemic, the schools were closed. So midday meals were actually not happening. People were getting dry ration which should have led to decline in the nutrition. Similarly, during the lockdown, we saw that a lot of maternal health also declined. We saw that people's school dropout rate increased. We saw people losing their jobs. So all the factors point out towards the poverty actually should not have declined so much in Tamil Nadu. Then how did it decline so much is still a question that many people have not been able to find answers towards. This is also one of the proofs that the data collection from the government side as per the authors is not correct because if you look at the situation on the ground it does not really tell you that poverty should have declined so much in the past five or six years. The data that we have has not been used properly. The multi-dimensional poverty index as per the author is not a great way to identify the poor because the average will be taken and individual parameters are ignored. It's similar to saying that let's say there are five subjects. In four subjects, you all scored 90, 90, 90, 90. But in the fifth subject, you only scored 50 marks. Then your average will still be very high. 
your average will still be about 82 percent marks but it does not tell you the fact that in one of the subjects you are almost about to fail you will be considered as a good student because you scored very good marks but you are ignoring the fact that in one of those subjects you did not really score very well similar is the case here as per the author, the multidimensional poverty index takes into consideration the overall average and not really takes into consideration the places where the person might need certain help. Now, let me also take this opportunity to share with you how exactly is this multidimensional poverty index calculated. Now, what you have to understand is multidimensional poverty index or MPI is actually a global index that is published by UNDP, United Nations Development Programme. Its own version is published in India also by the Niti Aayog. So there is an international MPI also and there is an Indian also. The global MPI published by UNDP has ranked India at 66th place out of the 109 nations. I will show you that particular index also in just a bit. But let's first focus on the Indian National Multidimensional Poverty Index given by the Niti Aayog. This takes into consideration three dimensions, health, education and standard of living which are further divided into a total of 12 indicators such as nutrition, school attendance, years of schooling, drinking water, sanitation, so on and so forth. The data that has been calculated through the MPI is the data of National Family Health Survey number 4 that gives all the data. This is where the questions have been raised. Some highlights of the report are that Bihar has the highest proportion of people which are under the poverty right now. Then we have Jharkhand and UP. Kerala registered the lowest poverty levels. In terms of the people who are facing malnourishment, again Bihar was at the very top. This is the gist of the report of the National MPI published by the Niti Aayog. As you can see here, 51.9% people in Bihar were considered to be multi-dimensionally poor, while Kerala performed the best. This is the other overall average number across the country. These are the 12 indicators. Housing, assets, having a bank account, electricity, drinking water, sanitation, so on and so forth. So as you can see, poor right now are not just identified on the basis of how much do they earn or how much do they spend. They are identified on the basis of all these indicators that you see here. The international MPI that is published by the UNDP actually takes into consideration these things. There are 10 indicators for the UN, for the global data that is published by the UNDP. For the Indian version, we took into consideration 12 indicators. So do remember that part and not be confused. The next article that we have here is about a slight debate whether the medical education in India should be given in local language or not. In very simple terms, this is actually a kind of an interview taken from two people. One who is a vice chancellor of Tamil Nadu's Dr. MGR Medical University and other by an assistant professor of the Department of Community Medicine in Vellore Medical College. So they have given their own points of view whether or not they think that vernacular language should be used to give medical education or not. Now, let me tell you the gist of this entire article. The authors here are saying that yes, it is preferable that you give medical education in vernacular language also. Vernacular means a local language. So a person living in Tamil Nadu should be taught medical education in Tamil. A person in Punjab should be taught the same in Punjabi, the same as Bengal, Gujarat, so on and so forth. So yes, ideally it should happen. Why? The simple reason being that just because a person is not good in English language, that should not deprive that person from actually learning medicine. There are various nations across the world that teach their students in the local language. There is Spain, there is Germany, China is also a prime example where all these nations give courses to their students in their own local language. But over here, I would like to point out to you one very, very important difference which the authors have ignored. What you can't ignore is that India is not the same as China or Germany or Spain. Why? Because even within India, we have so many languages. It is not just about Hindi or English or it is not just about Tamil or English. For example, you say that a medical college in Tamil Nadu will offer education in Tamil medium. But what if a person from Delhi, what if a person from Mumbai has taken admission in that medical college in Chennai? 
what would be the situation of that particular person that is an unresolved problem it's a unique problem with respect to india we don't see this problem in germany we don't see that in spain china etc but because india has so many languages within the country the problem is not just about english or some other language there are so many languages that there will be discrimination even amongst the students who are indians only and that is why there is an added layer of complexity when it comes to india and when it comes to taking decisions whether or not medical education should be given the local language or not the authors here say that all the medical students in india are guided by the regulations made by the national medical commission and this commission of the government instructs the medium of instruction to be english only now the other view is that the national education policy said that they should promote regional languages all that is fine but it's easy to say than actually implemented because medical is one of those fields which is connected all across the world for example when the vaccine for coronavirus was developed some of the development was done in india some of the studies were conducted in europe some of it was conducted in us china so on and so forth so when you have to collaborate all these studies when you want all these studies to be done together you obviously would prefer all of them to be in one common language you can't have technical terms be translated into your local language because that will create a huge barrier imagine those medical students who were in ukraine where they pursued their mbbs there and then when they come back to india and if they see that everything that they want to pursue for higher education that is in the local language and not in the english language so they would now have a problem in translating that so there are a lot of road blocks if you have to really give education the vernacular you have to start from the very bottom midway you cannot change and then also you have to answer that question what happens to people who move within the country from one state to the other state that also is still unresolved in india there has been certain attempt made in the tamil language for example the authors here say that a lot of academicians have come together in the field of education and they are compiling certain terms to be translated into the local language for example in the last few years 10 to 12000 of technical terms of medical profession have been translated and standardized and given to tamil nadu government because they all have to be common you can't afford that you go to one doctor in tamil nadu who actually speaks some other technical term and the other doctor in tamil nadu does not understand because he has translated the technical term in some other way so you have to understand there is has to be a proper vocabulary setup for example if a doctor tells you that you have diabetes every doctor in the world will understand what is diabetes you don't have to explain it to them but what if the word diabetes is translated differently in multiple ways in same language for example in tamil you have different versions of the word diabetes then it would obviously become a problem that is why you need one standardized explanation and interpretation of these technical terms specifically now this is a summarized version of this article there are certain challenges in having medical education in the local language as i said because india itself is an extremely linguistically diverse country english has been used as a language for professional competence yes we can move towards vernacular languages also but that would only have to be introduced from the very basic level and it can never 100% substitute the english language it may supplement the english language in certain cases for example when it comes to talking to the patient when it comes to explaining to the patients all that is fine but if you are in a medical room in an operation theater where the doctor is from one state the nurse is from the other state the helper is from a third state then you can't really afford to have conversation in the vernacular language only and that is what remains an issue and it's not to say that people who are not good in english can't really get medical education in english we have seen so many indian students who go every single year to us uk although they are not very good in english but they actually learn that so to say that medical education in english is depriving certain students of their rights is not entirely correct we also have to ensure that teachers also are equipped first before making such a drastic change in the education of medicine we have to ensure that teachers themselves are on the same page about the vernacular language if they have to translate something to the local language before telling it to the students as i said earlier also the national medical commission 
which actually is responsible for regulating medical education in India last year, that is in September 2021, said that it does not have any plans to allow MBBS course in Hindi or in other regional languages. There was a request put to the NMC, but they clarified that the courses will have to be in English language only. Similarly, doctors also have opposed this in many cases about the idea of offering MBBS in Hindi because this was proposed in the state of Madhya Pradesh but the doctor said it will be detrimental and irrelevant to change the curriculum language because again it's a very technical language and until you have a common vocabulary for each and every technical term which is recognized by everyone it will just create more confusion. The next article that we have here is about the new Criminal Procedure Identification Act of 2022. Now, in very simple terms, in 1920, a law was passed in India. That is 102 years back. The law simply was that if a person is arrested and is given punishment of one year or more than one year, then his or her identification will be taken. That is, the fingerprints will be collected, some other kind of identification, photo, etc. will be taken so that a record is kept of that person. So that later on, if you are searching for that person, if you, that person has run away, you can identify that person. That was the entire purpose of the 1920 law. That law is now being changed. It is now becoming even stricter in the form of the new 2020 law. The main differences are that number one, the earlier law had said that if you are arrested for one year or more than one year, only then your identification will be recorded. But now the new law says that even if you are charged with any small offense, even if you are charged with, let's say, over speeding, even then your record will be kept. It's not that your record will only be taken if you are jailed for one year or more. Now, even the smallest of offenses will mean that your record will be kept with the government for 75 years, seven, five years. The purpose of doing this is number one to identify the culprit against the person who has been arrested. Second, to identify the suspected repetition of any offenses. And third, to establish that whether or not you had earlier committed the same crime or not. Because what happens is a lot of times the law would say that if you commit the crime once, the punishment is lower. But if you repeat the same crime, the punishment is then higher. Then how does the judge get to know if you have committed this crime earlier or not? They can do that by checking your fingerprints, by checking these kind of identifications. That is why it was required. The 2022 version is much more stricter because of which people don't like it. Many people are saying that this goes against your right to privacy. Your right to privacy also includes your right to physical privacy. If you don't want to give your details to the government to keep, you should not be forced to do that. But the new 2022 law actually does the same. The Supreme Court also has said in the past that the 1920 law is very, very old and it needs certain changes. However, that doesn't mean that the changes that are introduced should violate your right to privacy. As per the new law, not just fingerprint, but your palm impression will also be taken. Your voice will also be collected. It will be recorded. Also, not just this, it will also include behavioral attributes, meaning how do you behave? It will also analyze you. So it's not just about the physical parameters. It's also about your behavioral attributes that will be recorded and there is no clarity on that. Secondly, as I said, the earlier law had said that your imprints will only be taken if you're imprisoned for one year or more. But the current law allows a measurement to be taken if you are arrested for any offense, even over speeding. And your record will be kept with the government for 75 years. Now, there is one very interesting point in this act. It says that if you are arrested for an offense for which punishment is less than seven years and the offense is not against women and children, then you have an option as a person who is arrested. You have an option to say no to giving your biological samples. If your punishment is less than seven years, if the crime was not against women and children, then you might say that, no, I don't want to give my biological samples. But this is not always allowed. Why? The law says it will be on the discretion of the police officer to allow this or not. Now, discretion of police officer is a very, very big phrase. 
let's say I say to the police officer, sir, I don't want to give my biological samples. The police officer will say, no, 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 I will take it. The police officer can forcefully take it. If I stop the police officer, the police officer will charge me for not allowing him to do his duty. So all in all, it is a big, big loophole. You can say no, but the police officer will decide. If I tell the police officer, no, you can't do that, then he can charge me with not allowing him to do his duty. So in short, you can still be forced to give your samples. Do remember, this point is only about biological samples. Apart from that, concerns have also been raised that this goes against a fundamental right. That is, it actually forces the people to self-incriminate. While as you know, Article 20 of the Indian Constitution allows you the right not to self-incriminate yourself. These are the important features of the new law. That is, the data will be kept for 75 years in total. The data will be kept specifically to identify if you have committed a similar kind of an offense earlier and if higher punishment has to be given. Modern techniques will be used to identify and store that data with the government. This is a table to actually identify the differences between the earlier and the current act. For example, the earlier act said that footprints, fingerprints, photographs will be collected. Now biological samples have also been added such as blood, semen, hair samples, so on and so forth. Even behavioral attributes will be included such as signatures, handwriting, how you behave, etc. Secondly, the person whose data may be collected has also changed. Earlier, the law was if you are imprisoned for one year or more, only then your data will be collected. But now it is for any, any offense, even if you are arrested under preventive detention. So even if you have not committed a crime, if you are just detained under preventive detention, even then your data will be collected. Earlier, the person whose permission was required to collect the data was investigating officer of the rank of sub-inspector or above. Now, a person in charge of the police station, SHO or rank of head constable can give the permission to collect the data. The next article that we have is a concerning news from the people who are suffering from the HIV. There have been protests across the country from HIV positive people who have been saying that the drugs that they require for their treatment are not available. We have NACO, that is a National AIDS Control Organization, which is responsible for ensuring the availability of the drugs, the availability of the test for HIV positive people. However, there have been multiple protesters who have been saying that this is not available and they are not getting the life-saving drugs that they actually require from the government's side. Government obviously has said that that is not the case. In most of the cases, there is no shortage of the drugs. Now, the problem with these kind of issues is diseases such as tuberculosis, HIV, they have a specific dosage. So if your dosage is of 20 tablets and if you eat only 15 or even 18, your entire course will be ruined and you have to start all over again. So if the person needs 11 tablets and the person is only given 6 because there is shortage of tablets and they are dividing it equally, then it is not helping anyone. That is the entire point of this particular protest. The people are saying because the drugs are in short supply, the agencies are actually distributing the drugs in such a manner that everyone gets a few doses. But that is not helping anyone. The protocol is not being followed and the supply of the medicine is restricted. Now, while this particular article might not be of that much importance, but this does give us a chance to understand more about the government's efforts to curtail the spread of HIV and how successful has the government been in doing that. Now, HIV, as you know, stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. This is a virus that causes AIDS. How the virus actually works is that this HIV virus attacks CD4, which is a type of white blood cell in the body. Now, white blood cells are very, very important because they are the ones who carry the antibodies in the body. They are the ones who are responsible for building our immune system. If the white blood cells or the T cells are affected, our immunity actually drops down. HIV, after entering the body, multiplies itself, damages the immune system, and it makes the body susceptible to a lot of attacks from outside. This CD4 count of a person reduces significantly and then the person actually gets ill very, very often and has a lot of chances of passing away. In India, the estimate of HIV can be understood from the HIV Estimation 2019 report given by the government. 
As per that report, India registered the highest number of HIV cases in the year 2000 and since then it has been declining. In 2019, the HIV prevalence in adult males was about 0.24%, while for adult females it was about 0.2%. There are close to 23.5 lakh Indians living with HIV in 2019, with Maharashtra being at the top of this unfortunate list. Now, as I said, there have been multiple initiatives taken by the government of India to fight against this. For example, in 2017, the parliament passed the HIV AIDS Act of 2017, to prevent and control the spread of HIV and AIDS in the country. It also provides for penalties for those who discriminate against those who have HIV. As we know, the people who have HIV are discriminated by people in the society. They are not given jobs. They are actually treated as untouchables, which is very, very harsh. So there is penalty for that. Then the government also follows a 90-90-90 strategy. Please do remember this. This is a strategy under which the aim is 90% of those who have the HIV should know that they actually have HIV because this is also a problem. Many people do, do have HIVs, don't really know their status. Out of those who know their status, 90% should be given the treatment. 90% of those who are given the treatment should see a positive result. That is a 90-90-90 strategy. So 90% of those who have HIV should know their status. Of those, 90% should be given the treatment. Of those, 90% should have a positive impact of the treatment. The Indian government also offers a free antiretroviral treatment. That is a drug that is given for HIV is given free of cost by the government. We also have national AIDS control program since 1992 to prevent the control of HIV AIDS in India. The tagline of this program is together for everyone's growth with everyone's trust. We also started a project called Project Sunrise in 2016 to tackle the rising HIV cases in northeastern states in India specifically. These are some of the initiatives taken by the government of India specifically to ensure that the prevalence of HIV can be curtailed in the country. These are the important articles from the Hindu newspaper today. Now a couple of practice questions. Number one, discuss the various initiatives taken by the Indian government to counter the problem of HIV in India. Evaluate the performance of such initiatives. Second, discuss the merits and demerits of offering medical education in vernacular languages in India. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. Thank you so much for watching the video. Have a good day ahead.